but how on earth am I going to use this guy? Even with a wig, I think it's going to look ridiculous if he has this Pac-Man sized head. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Sincast presented by CinemaSins. Welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from Cinema Sins, joined by Jonathan Watkins from Cinema Sins. Hello, hello. Today we have a very special guest, uh, director of Ghosts of War, uh, and I don't have it in front of me. What's the release date on this, Eric? That is July seventeenth. It's going to hit Amazon Prime and Apple. Uh, pretty much come out on all the big platforms as far as i understand it so everyone can get their hands on it okay also, very a cool couple of drive-ins i oh, have okay. no idea where those drive-ins are in america <laughs> but, uh, find one and get there yeah um but uh, we have the director of ghosts of war eric bress here today with us um i have a question off the bat though your last movie that you directed was the butterfly effect. Yeah. All the way back in 2004. Yeah. And this was a, uh, was a decent hit back in the day. If I recall, it was new lines, most profitable hit that year. Really? Yeah. Um, I, I uh, recently watched this and I was looking at the IMDb and I was like, this, this movie seems to have gotten, um, like a, a, a more dedicated following over the years is that is, have you found that to be true oh yeah i've definitely found it it's funny because before the film even came out i i think there was just an automatic bash la- backlash um over ashton kutcher in that people who had not seen the film were writing film reviews that said dude where's my time machine and it was, <laughs> he was at the he wasn't he wasn't even that well known yet uh, the way he is today. Uh, but they knew him from Dude Where's My Car, and that was enough for people to go sci-fi. What that guy <laughs> I also from that '70s show, um, and they didn't really watch the film or give him the credit he deserved because his performance is amazing, and he's obviously a brilliant entrepreneur and actor. Um, and then over time, I guess the people that would take the time to write in a review on IMDb, you know, brought it up to like a 7.6, which to me is really, really high. Yeah. It got like a 33 on Rotten Tomatoes. I think I checked that out recently. <laughs> right. Damn, man, it's hard to get that shit off your shoe. <laughs> I imagine so. I, it, it was just fun. It's fun to see a movie like this, though, because it's. You know, because I remember the bad reviews and probably at my age at the time, because that's where I knew Ashton Kutcher from was that 70s show. I probably didn't give it a fair shake either. Uh, It's almost like the movie just, you know, it unfortunately came out during a time that people weren't ready to see Ashton Kutcher uh, in a in a great role. And recently having seen it, I was like, wow, he is really good in this. I I must have been full of bullshit at the time when that movie came out. <laughs> you were one of those thirty three percenters. I, I was not a part of that thirty three percent. No, I was just a lowly movie theater worker at the time. Butterfly Effect came out, uh, but uh, having watched it again, I want to uh, I want to tell you how much I enjoy that film today. Oh, thanks, thanks. I actually watched it like. Um... A week ago, just to brush up for all the press that was coming up. Mm -hmm. For for a while, I could not watch that film. After editing, I I just got to get far away. I think once I heard James Taylor, the musician, on David Letterman. uh, And David Letterman asked, so um, if your song comes on the radio, do you listen to it? And James Taylor was just so deadpan. He's like, no. (laughs) <laughs> he goes on to explain how by the time you've done recording and mixing it you're so sick of it you just never want to ever hear that song again and for me the same is true for a film it takes a long time before i mean okay there's the premiere and then you'll watch it then and then maybe a couple of months have passed since you've seen it recently 
Uh, and then it's like, you've got to let years go by between viewings, you know, and I can watch any other movie pretty repeatedly. I mean, I will see Jaws once or twice a year. I will watch The mm-hmm. Shining once or twice a year. Um, but <laughs> the butterfly effect, no, I just know every inflection, uh, you know, every line of dialogue and it, it makes you crazy. I imagine so. Why? Uh, so uh, I know that you had after this movie and 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 uh, everything, you were a screenwriter on some of the Final Destination movies and everything. Um, but what what uh, finally got you back into? I'm gonna. I want to write and direct a movie uh, after 16 years. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, let's just be honest. It wasn't for lack of trying. It, w- it definitely was not that. It was that. I mean, my heroes were always Kubrick and the Coen brothers from, you know, from Blood Simple on Mm -hmm. or from being 10 years old. God, I think I watched Clockwork Orange every night Damn, (laughs) when I was 10 and 11 and then (laughs) Shining comes out in 1980 and I'm watching that, you know, whenever my parents aren't home. And, uh, And I loved those directors because their genres just flipped. You know, they never did the same thing twice. Even Big Lebowski and Raising Arizona, you can say they're both comedies, but their their tones are totally distinct from one another. Yeah. And, you know, and after Butterfly Effect, I'm like, OK. But, and it was there were two of us. It was Jay Mackay Gruber, my writing and directing partner. Mm-hmm. And we both loved the same things and thought very similarly. And we're like, that's great. The Butterfly Effect. Great. Been there. Done it. We have, uh, you know, we have a heist movie. We have a comedy. We have another kind of somewhat supernatural thriller, but it's not like the butterfly effect. And we really tried to bash our heads against the studio system when our, you know, reps would remind us, guys, you know, um, you really should just kind of stick to your wheelhouse because it's going to be a lot easier for you. But we were riding high on this our film was number we're an arrogant but we felt like okay this is how it happens you you work your ass off you make a film it's number one and then you kind of have some say in what you do next and boy i wish i could go back in time and tell that guy dude stay in your wheelhouse stay in (laughs) Stephen King, stranger things wheelhouse you will be much happier but instead, you know, uh, I just didn't know any better. And, you know, I, I, even to this day, I'm crazy. I write Westerns with a female lead, mm-hmm. knowing that there's in Hollywood two strikes against it. But <laughs> that's what I want to make because it's going to be so bloody and so violent. And, and we're going to see a school marm go from, you know, a poly purebred into Hannibal Lecter. And that's what I want to see. That's the arc I want to see in two hours. Yeah. I, I'm just one person, but I can tell you, I want to see that female led Western. If you want to, you know, if mm-hmm. you want to throw that to the studio, be like, I have at least one person that <laughs> is, uh, is dying to see that movie. Well, and- Here's a post dated check for the money he's going to spend on the ticket. <laughs> I <laughs> like this sucker. Well, and and not and and just to prove your point, one of my favorite movies of all time, The Quick and the Dead, mm-hmm. uh, was not a big, huge <laughs> box office success, and a lot of people sort of uh, poo pooed that movie when it came out, even though I think it's brilliant. And uh, so, yeah, I, I would also love to see this movie that you're writing with a female lead in a western. Yeah, I, I got four years ago, and I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why my reps still have me around. I wrote a supernatural <laughs> thriller, but in order for it to work, the leads just had to be in their 80s. <laughs> you know, it, it had to be Michael Caine and Helen Mirren. It really just that that's who I really wanted. And, you know, even just with a couple of years distance, I'm like, dude, what are you thinking? But when I'm writing, I'm not thinking like that. I'm like, yeah. this this would be great. This is actually that and and I also I, I listened to uh, the podcast all last night. So if I'm not coherent, you can only blame yourself because I, <laughs> I start dreaming I'm in the room with you, speaking to you guys, having <laughs> conversations. And it is very clear how well-versed you are in film. And I also watch a lot of film, although I feel like 
uh, a piker compared to you guys. <laughs> you're, you're really well informed on film. Uh, I feel like I'm not seeing enough. Maybe I'm watching Jaws too often or something. <laughs> but I, uh, I, whenever I'm writing, I always feel like I, I don't want to do that. I've seen it before. I don't want to do that. I've seen it before. So that's what puts me further out on this tree limb <laughs> where, right. okay, I think I found something. No one's ever done this before. It's uh, it's insane, but take a look at it and, you know, the reaction <laughs> might well be, yeah, that's insane. Good for you. It was cool, but, like, no one's going to make this. <laughs> that was sort of the experience I had with Ghosts of War because you set this up like a conventional ghost story in a mansion-type movie, even though it's World War II as its background and everything. Uh, you know, you, you sit there and go, okay, I've seen this before. I've seen this before. And then, and then you do something and we can't talk about it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you do something that I was like, Oh, Some, something happens. <laughs> something happens. Yes. Jonathan correct as always. Um, uh, something happens that we can't t- discuss, but I want to discuss so much, um, that changes, uh, the conventions of this. Uh, is there a way that you can talk about that without spoiling it? Yeah, I will. I'll try. Um, even if I talk about what happens before the event <laughs> you're referring to, mm-hmm. you know, I God, I, I wrote one movie, a horror movie that I guess sort of uh, insidious may have cut out the legs from under me where I wanted some ghost like thing to, you know, it's a typical haunted house movie. Family moves into the house. It's Amityville horror. Only Mm -hmm. when the thing says, get out, they do. And it follows them, follows them to the cheap motel room that they go into at the end of poltergeist where they roll out the TV Mm -hmm. and it kills the wife. And ultimately the man, the father ends up going to jail. And the thing is like, it's the ghost is now haunting him from jail. And this ghost has a very singular purpose. It always wanted to get to that jail, to take revenge on somebody who is in that jail. And, you know, again, do I know if this is a good, a good idea or a bad idea to me? I mean, if it's interesting and compelling and you're really with the characters and you care and then it's scary I think there's a good chance for success. But the minute I pitched it uh, to a pretty prominent studio, their first reaction is horror only works in a home with a family because a home is where you feel safe. Uh. And the family is who we identify with. That's the, th- those are the films we make. That's it. And uh. I just walked out of that meeting you know, just so discouraged, you know, and forget my stupid idea. I get a million of them, <laughs> but like <laughs> I thought that all horror has to be relegated. I understand if you say, look, Blumhouse changed the landscape. We're only making movies for two and under. And even then we have to find actors to work for back end only. I get that, that your hands are tied financially. But when you take an ideological stance that horror only works under this incredibly narrow spectrum, I'm like, oh man, I don't want to sit here and play the game that we all on this conversation could play that, you know, mm-hmm. proves all of evidence to the contrary. But it was just like, oh, it was killing me to hear that. But I couldn't resist writing Ghosts of War, which is still, I couldn't do it. I just could not stand to watch another film where the family moves into the haunted house and it's the same tropes and the same scares and the same setups. I wanted to see something different. I mean, I, I remember when, uh, and if I'm all over the place, cause, uh, that's where I live, but like when, <laughs> when in the 13th, Jason takes Manhattan came out and I was a kid. I'm like, yeah, like I've seen him in the woods. I know what that looks like. What's it like when he goes up against Crips and Bloods? Like, <laughs> that's what I want to see. Guys who have Glocks and know how to kill you with a car antenna. You know, like, wow. Yeah, or what's that- it like when he's on a boat? You know, yeah, we found out right. that too. Right. Yeah, that, right. In the whole movie, I think. Uh, yeah. 
we got that version. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was so like, oh, so disappointed at the end of that. But that's like, that's what I want to see. I want to see, and I think like in a way Die Hard changed it up, you know, like, well, we're not going to see the same thing we've always seen. We're not going to see Arnold Schwarzenegger go against a big crooked chinned Russian. We're going to make it an everyman. And I guess in horror, I wanted the opposite. I, I didn't want the everyman. I wanted to see like a badass take on a ghost. What would that look like? Uh, even in Aliens, Ripley, we don't know she's a badass till, <laughs> you know, till we see the actions that she takes and see her fearlessness. She kind of earns that badass heroism more towards the end. Um, at least I'm thinking of part one and part two. Mm -hmm. But in this, I just said, you know what? Fuck it. I want to see soldiers. What would that look like? And that's kind of what got me involved is like, I, I want to see what happens when badasses are stuck in a house with a ghost. And what I found really interesting about the time period was that just growing up, like my grandfather would not talk, you know, that generation of men did not talk about their feelings. And mm -hmm. I thought it would be that much more interesting to see the men experience these ghostly encounters and of course, they're not going to talk about it. And of course, they think this is before there was PTSD. There, were, You know, this was just some shell shock or combat fatigue, you know, something. They were seeing things in the corner of their eyes, you know. I mean, it's, it's sort of a part of the job. So they're not going to talk about it necessarily immediately to their, to their, you know, comrades in arms. So... I just found that would, was like the most interesting take on it. And that's when I decided, all right. And because of the event that happens, <laughs> that sort of pulls the rug out, rug out from under the audience. I want to serve up tropes. I want people to be instantly familiar with these characters, right down to their names. The dorky one is named Eugene. You can't get more <laughs> on the nose than that. Our lead is Chris Goodson. That's, well, it sounds like Christ Goodson. I'm serving it to you as hot off the trope machine as I can. And, and I want people to sort of feel that familiarity with the genre and sort of be led astray down a path I've chosen for them before everything we've watched comes to mean something different in hindsight by the end of the film it is a knockout blow by the way i'm gonna go ahead and and say mm -hmm. that this this path that it takes you down uh the the horror that is awaiting in this uh in the uh, in this movie is 10 times maybe 100 times more than what you're seeing at the beginning of the movie um and uh i i i you know i know this is just an interview and everything but well done i i really enjoyed the uh, way where you took us in this movie well thanks uh, you know cuz cuz you never know right <laughs> you never know it's it's a risk and uh i was lucky that those producers the the producers i that i worked with were willing to uh take that risk with me um so Tell me how you uh, how you assembled this cast. There are a couple of people I had seen before. Uh, Brenton Thwaites I've seen uh, a few times, and Skylar Aston I had seen a few times, and of course Billy Zane pops up in this. Uh, and uh, as long as uh, and as well, uh, well as uh, I don't know if I even well I guess it's in the credits. So Sean Tube shows up in this as well. But uh, how did you assemble this cast? It's funny when I when I met Brenton Thwaites, we we needed a lead, and he I had already seen him in a number of things, but Oculus is the one that stood out the most to me. Yeah, Oculus scared the shit out of me. Just the, the first half of it was so creepy, um, and done so well in somewhat broad daylight which i give extra props to mike flanagan for pulling that off mm -hmm. uh, and i knew I, I that he was the guy he was the face i didn't even realize he's australian like his accent was perfect and i thought this guy is fantastic and the and 
you know, Hollywood is a money machine. So your lead has to be have a certain net worth or value to the financiers before anything's going to be greenlit. And the lead isn't even necessarily enough. Your supporting cast has to have so many units of value before it, it measures up to the budget and you can make a, you know, get a green light out of it. And for them, or for any director who, who has the cachet that I do, which is I'm not Christopher Nolan <laughs> and I don't get my pick of every great actor, the greatest actors in the world. <laughs> I have to fight a little harder. Um, the creative choices that come your way aren't through the genius of a casting director. They're through the genius of money. And sometimes you're just being given horrible options, you know, things that do not like you just wonder, did they read the script? Cause like, I know that they're, they want this movie to get made. I know that they are, they have nothing but the best intent for the film mm -hmm. yet. Damn, could you just get your heads off of that spreadsheet and and come on a creative journey where we try to get the right guy for the for the role? Um, and I think we had gone through some of the big A list Hollywood names, and you know, as expected, most of them had, did not want to do genre, or their reps wouldn't even show it to them because it was genre hmm. and. So the, your choices are getting slimmer at this point. And Brenton was like, the, he was sort of the last chance to A, get someone that could get the film greenlit and B, someone that I actually thought would be perfect and turned out I was right. I mean, he's, yeah. he's perfect. He's, he's abs I can't imagine this with any of the other people that were thrown at me. Um, and he was in town visiting in Los Angeles with his uh, wife and baby. And we, I, we wanted to meet. He, he wanted to at least talk to me about the script. The version that he had of the script wasn't even what made it to the screen. It was a little more loosey-goosey, a little more over the place. I hadn't quite nailed down yet. Um, what the curse is that the ghosts are the, the rules. I hadn't really nailed down the rules. It was kind of, it, it wasn't well, it, it was kind of poorly written at that point. Some of the major things that are still in the movie were there, but um, I hadn't done the last bit of hard work to get it across the goal line to streamline it. So we knew what a Vetralek curse is that appears in the film and has an explanation. Um, it just, in fact, there was one time where, like I said, I was trying to lean into the tropes of cinema that I liberally stole from The Conjuring, that three list rule written on a cardboard <laughs> of infestation, um, obsession, and uh, I don't know, when they take over your body completely. Uh. But, uh, and I wanted, and I had that in there just to throw viewers off the, the trail a little bit. Um, so he was a little confused by the script. You know, it, 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 it had some strange holes in it that didn't need to be there. Um, and I decided, okay, well, let's meet. And I'm looking at where he is on the map and where I am on the map. I'm by the coast. Mm -hmm. and, I look at, and I draw a, law, a line through the center of Los Angeles. And right under my finger is the Veterans Cemetery. And I'm like, oh, man, this is such a directory thing to do, isn't it? I'm going to have to meet me at a cemetery. And, oh, man, this sounds like, you know, okay, perfect. All right. So we meet there in the parking lot. And I'm thinking, dude, I think you went too far. <laughs> your, your artistic bullshit got the better of you on this one. As we literally start silently walking uh, respectfully amongst the graves of the fallen. And there's no way we can start to really talk about the script at that point. And there are other uh, mourners there. And uh, after like 20 minutes of me going, dude, you fucked up. You should be at a coffee shop right now. Uh, we headed back to the parking lot and found a bench and started talking through the script. And I'm, and I'm terrified. I'm like, dude, this guy, like, he doesn't put up with this kind of bullshit. Like, you know, 
<laughs> he's, he's just got off Pirates of the Caribbean and, you know, he's the <laughs> greats out there and like, what am I doing? But we'd had, but it then turned into this awesome conversation about the material where I tried my best to take him through the logic of the film, even while doing it, realizing, oh shit, that doesn't make sense. I got to fix that later, you know? And mm -hmm. we had a great conversation about what the film was and why we were doing it. And once we got Brenton and he finally, you know, I think he was a little hesitant at first. I think because of the script in his hand, he had every good reason to be a little gun shy about it. But ultimately, thankfully, uh, within two weeks, I got a call that's saying he was in. And from that point on, we could start going after the other cast. Um, Skyler, uh, Austin, who people may know best from Pitch Perfect, but he is in you know TV shows. He's done theater in New York. I mean, he he's you know like an improv king. Like he is not to mention a pretty good singer. If mm -hmm. that ever come up in your film, uh, didn't hear. But <laughs> you know. I, I think this is the first time I saw him not sing. So that was that was. Oh different. really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I'm glad to show that other side. Yeah. Um, but he was fantastic. We met, he was close enough to uh, Venice Beach. Uh, I really, I'm not like a coffee shop guy. I'd really just rather walk around. And maybe I, I, I uh, shouldn't put other people through what I like to do. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we just started walking along Venice Beach and talking and he's from Queens and my mom's from Queens. And like, we just hit it off. We have very similar backgrounds and, um, you know, he really connected with the character and we were going over accents that he could do because his family comes from the East coast. So we were thinking, well, what should Eugene be? And, you know, we started even just, just getting into the work. And that's always a huge pleasure because that's the one thing that I feel I know better than anyone on the planet is my script that I wrote. And, you know, now that it's written, we can bend it. We can play with it. I don't, there's nothing written in stone and everything can be better. So collaboration, you know, there are those directors that are like, say those lines exactly the way I wrote them. Mm -hmm. period, And they're famous for it. And I'm like, well, it depends on the actor. <laughs> and, you know, like, <laughs> want to let your actors do what they get paid to do professionally and let them do it well um and with Skyler you know that was great to collaborate with him in his hotel room where we shot the film in Sofia Bulgaria was right across the hall from mine so occasionally I would probably go there you know at night after shooting and knock on his door and go dude I changed a couple of lines tell me what you think about this and we would sit there for another hour before going to bed uh, because he has the biggest speeches in the film and uh, we could just kind of go over it right then and there so so that was that was a blast Theo Rossi is perfect I mean like a, with the Sons of Anarchy street cred, and I've watched that entire series twice. And, you know, I have a Harley. <laughs> you know, I know what each character rides and why they would ride a, a soft tail or why they would have a Dynaglide. Like I, like, I can tell that, you know, when they made that show, every character had, you know, would have a very specific reason for choosing the bike that they chose. And I knew that Theo, well, I would find out that Theo definitely pays attention to those kind of details. He is a complete devotee to the craft. And I looked him up online and I read an interview or, you know, some articles about him and found out that he is really was during the making of Sons of Anarchy. He was very exacting in the makeup trailer of getting the tattoo on his character Juice's head just right <laughs> before going on to the set every day. And I'm like, great, perfect. <laughs> you know, like that's the guy. And I thought he had a really interesting sort of background. It was more diverse. He's, he's, he's got all kinds of people in his background and I didn't want, and you know, this undiverse non-diverse, I don't know what the word is, uh, you know, cast 
for this for this World War II, even though it's World War II, and I and he nails his character perfectly, which is kind of the straight man. Mm-hmm. You know, like there, there's the muscle bound guy, Butchy, right, <laughs> right, you know? and and I needed Kirk, whose name doesn't really mean anything to me, <laughs> but he's the straight man. He is sort of who we bounce ideas off of when other people are losing their minds. Um, and he was fantastic. Alan Ritchie, the guy who plays Butchie, I saw some, I just watched some audition tapes of him, uh, on a television show where like, I didn't realize, Oh, he's one of the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> what I know, you know I'm, like, I'm not a Ninja Turtle guy. And apparently you can't see his face that well in those movies. <laughs> But he, uh, I saw this, this, these episodes of his, like on his reel, and he was so funny. His timing, his comic timing was so hilarious. I'm like, oh God, that's, that's, that's more important than the muscles he brings to the table. Like, <laughs> this guy is a comic genius, like, perfect. Cause, cause Butchie is that guy, this laid back, even though we're in hell, he can crack a joke guy. <laughs> The last person was Kyle Gallner. And we literally hadn't, we're in Bulgaria. We are a week away from shooting and every day. And we don't have this one character of the deranged sniper. It's to me, the most interesting member of the cast. I was just about to say, this is my favorite character in the whole movie. And uh... <laughs> I'm glad because he does some pretty despicable things when we first meet him. Right. And I always thought of this character as he has a character arc that goes in reverse. Yeah. When you first beat him, you think he is absolutely batshit crazy. And the more the movie goes on, it's more like he's finally where we finally land with him is Oh, he's just a really cool dad who misses his kids mm-hmm. and he's at war and he's totally grounded and easy to be with and, you know, pleasant. And I, I thought that was really interesting, but I had to find someone who could be that crazy eyed motherfucker. <laughs> like I needed that guy. And we went through a number of people some some who were fantastic who i thought oh they could totally nail this look at that i don't even i can't mention who they are but you would right. know who they are mm-hmm. and i was really torn because Kyle Gallner he you know i'd known him from a lot of things he has a pretty distinct face and i'd seen him in nightmare on elm street and i'd seen him in you know a number of other things and he just did this amazing TV show for, I think it's Apple TV interrogation. Maybe it's not Apple TV. Don't kill me, Kyle. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. It's uh, CBS uh, All Access. Oh, yes. I'm, yeah. yeah. Let's see. The humble brag. I can afford <laughs> CBS All Access. <laughs> it's not bad, man. Um, and I wanted him, but we were Skyping. And this is a week away from shooting. And every day I have the assistant directors and second assistant directors in Bulgaria going, where are we with Tapper? Where's our Tapper? Do we have a Tapper? And I'm like, ah, oh, still looking. Just hold on. I know we have costume fittings to do, but um, we're still looking. And the problem with Kyle is he was on a TV show where he had to have hair halfway down his back and they would not let him cut it. And he, so I was like, Jesus Christ, I am absolutely convinced he's the guy but how on earth am I going to use this guy? Even with a wig, I think it's going to look ridiculous if he has this Pac-Man sized head. <laughs> like, <laughs> Q-tip hiding this giant uh, pile of hair. Um, so I go online and I look at all this World War II uh, imagery and photos and you know documentaries. And what I find out is and I think Kyle may have helped with this research too. And we started texting each other photos back and forth that snipers were given a certain leniency with the clothes they wore. Hmm. And as they would be 
you know, they they could have mustaches. Like whenever you watch a World War II movie and these characters have mustaches, it's bullshit. Like maybe <laughs> if you're a general, fine. But you cannot have a mustache, you know. It, <laughs> Vietnam, go crazy. But not World War II. Um, but there were snipers who had a little peach fuzz here and there. And they would be allowed to wear knit caps hmm. uh, for hiding in their you know, sniper's nest, wherever they were going to be uh, on cold nights. So I was like, that's it. All right. A uh, knit cap, that will cover his hair. We can tuck that right up. We never need to see any hair on this guy. And uh, we hired him. And as you have seen, his performances are like, he's just great. Mm-hmm. There, there is a scene at one time after a Nazi attack, I can say that, where the men have all gone a little crazy. And Kyle's character is just smoking a cigarette, staring out onto the front lawn of the mansion where the horrors just happened. And he's just smoking and his eyes are nuts and he's not talking and he looks disturbed. Yeah. And our... <laughs> our assistant director forgot to yell cut. We like have a little dolly move in there and we're watching him and we're getting closer and focusing more on his face. And the shot just hangs there and hangs there and hangs there. <laughs> and then finally he's like, Oh God, sorry, cut. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Eric. I was just mesmerized. And you know, that's, that's what he can do as an actor and after watching interrogation it's like oh he's amazing he plays like between a 17 year old and a 40 year old because the series just is epic and goes through the years and it's it's a good um, series it really is yeah yeah and and he's just fantastic in it uh so anyone get your cbs access check it out (laughs) I feel like Kyle, Kyle's awesome though. I feel like I've been watching him for about 20 years. Cause I remember he was on Veronica Mars. Um, and he had a really super cool, interesting character arc on that series um, as well. And he just, he always draws your attention. Um, no matter what you're watching, he he's the one that just kind of draws your attention. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, he's definitely got that, whatever that is. <laughs> well, yeah, I started watching Veronica Mars because <laughs> I knew he was in it. And I think he shows up like maybe around season three. So I'm trying to get to season three and yeah. I'm binging season one, season two. And this is uh, what, back in the CW days where every season mm-hmm. is 22 episodes. And like after, after like five days, I'm like, I got to watch something else. I just <laughs> watch something else i mean it's a great show but i was like i i I gotta watch something else so i never got to kyle's stuff yet the days of 22 episode seasons um (laughs) oh yeah geez forget about that um this is uh the what i liked also you you say about you talk about how these soldiers don't want to talk about their feelings but i at least like the fact that you acknowledge they they acknowledge that they're in a place that's haunted early on uh they don't sit there it's not like happening to just one person or anything like that and like you know three other people are like ah well this guy's you know this guy is just full of shit you know he's just blah 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 there were a couple of things that the opening of this movie some some sort of philosophies reminded me of uh in close encounters of the third kind there's uh there's you know there's pilots who see ufos and they're at, and they they're asked to confirm or did you think these are alien spacecraft um and and uh and from dust till dawn came to mind because there's the whole speech with George Clooney where he's like he's like I don't fucking believe in vampires but I know what I just saw so <laughs> let's all just start believing in vampires now you know <laughs> right <laughs> And that's what I that's what I like about this is that even though these these soldiers are doing that because there's an early scare on where the one of the guys is like one guy's like whoa who was that and the other other soldiers like well i don't know what that was that could have been anything um so uh, that that was one of the things that i liked was that even in even when you're setting up this kind of a, a trope of of you know haunted mansion and everything uh there are things about it even in the beginning that clue you in that this is a little bit different because 
once they acknowledge that they are in a haunted mansion, then it's, di it's different, you know, like there's none of this, this like, oh, I don't believe this person, which I find personally grating in horror movies where, right. they, you know, and, and that, and when that, once they acknowledge it, you're free to do whatever you want to do in this movie. It's funny the, the final destination series all has this one obligatory sequence where our hero who is experiencing something <clears throat> that makes no logical sense needs to go on the internet. And the producer <laughs> of the film, one of the producers is Craig Perry. Mm -hmm. And every time a final destination, you know, he starts, he's like, God damn it. How do we make that different this time? <laughs> right. And inevitably you have to go back to the same headlines. Freak accident, you know, <laughs> strike somebody in Sunnyvale, California, right. you know, and it's it's deadly. And for those of us who watch a lot of horror movies, we've seen the denial for hours and at weeks of our lives have been spent watching characters in denial. And I'm with you. You just sort of want to get to it, get to where yeah, you get it. You're in a situation. What are you going to do about it? Right. And in, and the scene you're talking about originally in the first probably 10 cuts of the film came 15 minutes later Oh, wow. where we had that much more denial and on paper, it really worked. I mean, it was fine. And even for the earliest cuts of the film, everything held together. There was still a logic to the fact that no one, you could still buy as long as me, the writer director was pushing the point that these are men from the forties, they're not going to talk about it yet. And <laughs> no one else kind of has to grumble and go, Oh Jesus. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know, but this guy seems pretty passionate about it. <laughs> and then finally during the 200th viewing, I'm like, yeah, they're right. Th mm -hmm. This is nuts. So we literally tried to take that entire scene and well, we did take it and we pushed it 15 minutes earlier and it just made a world of difference. Now, there are some continuity flaws that occur because <laughs> of it. Um, one of our soldiers, Eugene, has an injured hand. And I'll tell anyone who's you know listening to this and I'll let you know, look at his hand. It's filthy dirty. And then in the previous scene, it was clean and pristine. <laughs> and then later, it's clean and pristine again until there's a reason it gets dirty. Um, so you can keep your eye out for that because, yeah, that <laughs> scene was never meant to belong where it was. And I'm in the editing room going, oh, my God, on a 60-foot screen, all people are going to be doing is staring at it. <laughs> with bandages. Uh, and then I said, yeah, I don't care. It, no. In the end, bad. though, your your premise, even uh, even, I don't know, I don't. If this, if you feel like <laughs> this is a spoiler, then we'll cut this out. Okay. But your but your premise uh, allows that to happen. I think, like, oh yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you can have yeah. continuity errors. Oh, and there are so many intentionally put in there, not in terms of. The bandages, and I know what you're talking about, obviously. Mm -hmm. The speech, the things people say, there are lines of dialogue that only because you know what you know, and we're talking about something that the audience has no idea what we're talking about, so you may want to cut it anyway. <laughs> um, there are, I don't know, malapropisms or anachronistic things happening right. or people making references perhaps to things that don't exist <laughs> <laughs> yes. using phrases that wouldn't necessarily be spoken. Uh, so, um, and it all makes sense later and it was done as delicately as possible. So when you're watching it, it doesn't appear out of place, but for a second timer, you realize, Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, no, that, no, he wouldn't have said that. <laughs> by, by the way, going back to that hand though, I have a, I don't have like a full on, uh, I guess that's a boudoir. I have a, I guess an armoire or whatever <laughs> they call that. Um, I'm now terrified of that thing. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you accomplished something there um, by making, <laughs> making an object right. like that frightening. Cause I never would have thought for a million years it could do that. I don't know that it even can, but I've seen it do it now. 
So I'm I'm staying away from that. Uh, my wife can get stuff out of that thing uh, <laughs> moving forward. <laughs> well, when when the actors were dragging that thing across the set. It began to tip over by itself, and it oh, wow. kind of scared the shit out of everyone. And we we're like, "Well, they caught it. They put it back. We're leaving it." <laughs> and then still kind of, yeah, just like, "Oh, it was more scary maybe on the set than it would appear in the movie." <laughs> but yeah, that, that thing has a life of its own. So stay out of our. Speaking more. of that set, though, that mansion was everything shot. Was that the actual mansion? Everything that was shot, or were there some? I don't know if you had some extra sets, but just that mansion was awesome. I don't, I don't know where that was or. Um... In Sofia, Bulgaria. Okay. The king used to be a king. Then uh, I guess in the early nineties, everything changed. Um, and now they are uh, <laughs> more of a republic than a uh, monarchy. But um, that used to be the king's house. And there is a house. Off to the side of that property that has, was always framed out um, where the king now lives today. And the actual house, the mansion, is a museum. So the entire movie was, I hate to say it because it's like when I watched the uh, behind the scenes of making the descent and I'm like, that'll never scare me again. <laughs> like the weird alien dudes dressed up walking through that two feet of prop cave uh, that just gets rotated around to create an endless cave. Um, but everything was built. Antonello okay. Rubello was the, is this amazing Italian production designer who lives in Sofia. Uh, and he designed for me the entire bottom floor and top floor, which was on a second sound stage of the house. So every, because at first, we were going to shoot the film in Canada, and I'm looking all over Canada at mansions in uh, in Vancouver, that area, and looking for, I don't know, a kitchen that looks like it was from the 40s. And even if you have a, a historic monument, they've redone the kitchen. I mean, it's modernized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then, kitchens were like almost the stoves of the house. Like that's where your fireplace, that's where your heating system was, was that oven in the kitchen. There were fireplaces too, but what would send heat throughout the entire house in the vents was that old school stove system that was there in, in many of them. Um, so we had to, we had kind of no choice but to build the mm -hmm. entire thing. And that necessitated shooting in Bulgaria rather than Canada, where everything that the price would go down on every level. Um, and I could do what I wanted, which is, okay, it'll, this movie has a tracking shot and it'll never be 1917. <laughs> and if you, you could miss it, <laughs> but like I wanted like the beginning of the shining during the interview chapter, you know, I wanted a tracking shot that would take mm -hmm. us the whole mansion, lay out the geography so we didn't have her have to explain it again. Um, so the whole mansion was built from the ground up. And I've been on sets in America. And I got to say, for the crew that we had in Bulgaria, there was so much attention to detail in the aging of the paint. And normally you say, OK, we're going to be shooting in this part of the room. And you put a radiator blocking that or something. And they don't bother to paint behind the radiator. Because what's the point? Mm -hmm. This was like almost a fully working house. And there was no crack that was left, you know, unattended to simply because, well, no one asked us specifically to do that. Like everything was completely from top to bottom was perfect. Every inch of that place you could have shot in. Um, and then the trick was to tie the exterior to the interior mm -hmm using visual effects and blue screen and you know if there are places where they run from inside the out to inside the house to outside the house somehow tying that all together seamlessly um and luckily there weren't so many of those moments that um it created a huge headache but you know that's it, you just it all had to be planned out in advance 
Yeah, you all. Well, you all nailed it. I mean, you you fooled me. I had no idea. Uh, those are that's amazing that they were built like that. I didn't know if you'd pulled like a Charlie Band and like bought a castle in Romania or something so you could uh, film ten movies or you know whatever that was he did. <laughs> that was the plan. And when I was first shown that castle, I was shown the interior of it. That was yeah. part of it. Those photos were taken like ten years ago before it had been turned into a museum. But in order oh, wow. to over to Bulgaria, they're like, look, well, yeah, man, you can shoot here. They've done movie shoots there. Like, there's a Stallone movie there. There's a you know, there's there's tons of big action yeah. movies. You know, in fact, look, see, you can see the rubble from the gunfight that was just recently shot there. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Um, but what we ended up with was even better because then I got oh, to yeah. design every room um to to tie everything together exactly the way i I wanted to wow it's crazy built that was just built from scratch then that was that's in that's insane that's a really good job there that's one of those things like you know like it probably should deserve an award of some sort but it's so real looking that people won't believe that you actually built it (laughs) It's like the the parking garage in uh, Seinfeld. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is a yeah famous story. There, like you know, they didn't win the uh, the set design because people thought it was a real parking garage. Um, <laughs> I never heard that. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, do you have any other projects that you can talk about? Um, there's one that we're casting for right now called Wrecking Ball. Mm-hmm. Um, it's. Again, this is where I always go out on a limb and say, okay, Ghost of War just came out. I don't want to do another Ghost movie. Let's do something totally different. Um, and it's sort of, it's it's called Wrecking Ball, and it's like taken. But what if the person with an amazing particular set of skills was a handyman janitor? <laughs> that cool. Building. And knew how to rig your apartment to be like a Final Destination sequence where you would have a horrible death um, (laughs) once revenge shit hit the fan. And it's more like Joker, a character piece where we spend time with this person. And after he loses the one thing on the planet he loves, he has this incredibly violent past that ever since he had a daughter, he's buried. And it's really a metaphor or allegory or metaphor for like uh, being an alcoholic or an addict where he put the plug in the jug of his violent past. But now little by little, he's able to resurrect that violent side of him and then crosses an invisible line where he can't stop, even though he should stop by now. Mm-hmm. Now, he's achieved what he wanted to achieve, but <laughs> the, the wheels come off the cart and he's going to take the violence to, to the end of the line. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I love it. It's more of a straight shooter than mm-hmm. uh, than than Ghosts of War. Um, and it's, you know, fairly contained, but um, I just love the, the the character piece of it. It's just... You know, we, we really spend a lot of time just uh, with, with one person on un, un, uh, peeling back the layers of the onion. So uh, I'm, I'm actually really excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ghost of War comes out July 17th. Both Jonathan and I will swear by this movie. It's really mm-hmm. good. Absolutely. Um, and um, and uh, Eric Bress, thank you so much for coming to talk about it. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's always great to to hear directors talk about like the, the process and everything. I find it fascinating. Well, thanks. I, it was a pleasure to be on here. <laughs> like I said, I listen to your podcast. So I'm uh, like, wow, I'm hanging out with my friends. <laughs> that, that's uh, that. Thank you very much. I, <laughs> I, 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 I'd hardly ever expect someone to have heard of our podcast, much less uh, um, actively listen to it and everything. So I appreciate it. Uh, you know, uh, we, we try our best, you know, <laughs> so. oh, oh, it's all last night. Uh, one of the things it was when, after Joel Schumacher passed and I'm like, you're talking about the repertoire of Joel Schumacher. And one, one of you asked the other, you know, well, have you seen Tigerland? And I'm like, Oh, Ooh, yeah. Tigerland. <laughs> Tigerland. 
This is the most amazing thing. Colin Farrell's never been better. Everyone, oh, oh, they can't hear me. Yeah, see, and I, I know I need to watch this now because right after we we uh, did that episode, people came onto our Facebook and and said, "Yeah, you got to watch Tigerland. Tigerland's great." And I was like, "Oh, okay, geez, I I didn't remember it." being considered a great movie back when it came out but now i have to watch it so i'm looking forward to it now uh but yeah. uh but yeah appreciate it and i and uh, like i said uh i w- i was probably one of those people who were wrong about the butterfly effect when it came out in 2004 because i probably had the same even though i liked ashton kutcher <laughs> i was probably still like you know i was like ah, i don't know if i could believe him in something like this and over time i have grown to appreciate that movie a lot more so if, if you guys haven't seen the butterfly effect recently watch that too it's a great movie absolutely thanks a lot appreciate um it. all right uh we'd like to thank eric Bress for showing uh showing up and talking to us uh once again um uh, you can go to all of our usual things to uh come talk about this episode uh but uh that's gonna do it for this interview it's chris atkinson and jonathan watkins we'll see you next time thanks for listening Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasins.com.